Welcome back to Kings of Columbus. Doug Maurice going solo on this one, which I know is disappointing to some of you, but there's some stuff we want to catch up on. And I will tell you that Kings of Columbus next week, Landis and I already have something planned where we're going to look back at some Ohio State Michigan stuff, searching for lessons for this Ohio State Michigan game. But on this show, we're going to do some rants, right? Uh, what are you mad about? Yeah. It's a pretty good offseason. I don't I like I I have other things planned because I I don't know that you have a lot to rant about. How can you be mad in June at this Ohio State team? Oh man, I'm so what are you mad about? But so we have a couple little things. We're also going to talk about Natty or Bust again, because because my the big Natty or Bust conversation that I had about Ohio State, we did on Kings of the North. I, I know a lot of you guys watched that or listened to that. But I have some reactions to tech subscribers. Um, I, I want to get your voices in there. Landis and I also did. I wanted to get Landis's voice on that. We did a little bit of that. But I, I want to hear from you guys. So I have some um, answers from our texters about Natty or Bust. We have most important players for different Ohio State coaches, which, again, as a, as a lot of our stuff does, don't tell anybody. The secret is that you guys give us the good ideas. So this was a texter idea. Who is the most important player for Jim Tressel, for Luke Fickle, for Urban Meyer, for Ryan Day as Ohio State coaches? I gave our tech subscribers my answer, and then I gave them a survey, and then they answered back. So we'll discuss that a little bit. But off the top, we're going to talk about how to ruin Michigan. Because, again, some of you, uh, wow, just – Absolutely diabolical. And this came from uh, a devious texter named Ben. This is the scenario that he put me in. You're a Buckeye sleeper agent in the Michigan football program, and you've risen to head coach. You will soon be discovered. So you have time for just one action to do the most harm to Michigan. What do you do? So I think this is an interesting conversation about what is the most important thing to an established football program? What is the, the most foundational thing that, that wouldn't change, that doesn't adjust? And so people change. Players, by the nature of the sport, constantly change. Coaches can change, right? Athletic directors can change. But what about a program doesn't change? So I think this, I think you could think about this in your own way. If there was a Michigan's, is there a Mich if Connor Stallions got a job, like had, you know, like you guys have seen the face off movie. If Connor Stallions, let's just say Connor Stallions got a new face and he got hired at, now, now I'm going to make you nervous. Now, like the next 10 people that get hired at Ohio State, you're going to be thinking to yourself, is this Connor Stallions? Are you Connor Stallions with a new face? You guys have seen face off. Face off. That's not generational, right? Everyone's seen face off. You take your face off. John Travolta and Nick Cage took their faces off. Face off. Connor Stallions, face off. So let's just say that Carlos Lachlan is Connor Stallions with a new face. What would he do to Ohio State? So I think the foundational thing that would shake a program, and only certain programs, is you mess with their stadium. And when you think about the great, great, historic, landmark stadiums that are defining for programs, certainly Ohio Stadium is one of those. Certainly Michigan Stadium is one of those. Beaver Stadium at Penn State is one of those. Tennessee Stadium is one of those. I think those are the four that are over 100,000. You know, Bryant Denny at Alabama, you'd hurt him. Death Valley, LSU, you'd hurt him if you messed with the stadium. Texas, you'd hurt him if you messed with the stadium. And so what I said is like I would drop nuclear waste in Michigan Stadium and make it uninhabitable that you cannot use like this stadium and this spot for 100 years. And then I got some advice from people. I'm like, well, you picked the wrong kind of nuclear waste. It's like, okay, well, if we're going to get into that, I would get a nuclear person to help me. But if I'm really trying to blow a hole in a program long term, that's where I went. Because I think so many other, other things you can recover from. 
and they're going to miss Jim Harbaugh, but I think they can recover from it. And plus that already happened to them. So if you would ask this question a year ago, maybe you would say, get Jim Harbaugh out of there. Maybe, maybe it would be a short-term answer, an easy answer. It, I don't think it can be a player answer. So then it's like, what could you do long-term that makes it more difficult for them to get good players? What makes it more difficult for them to be a national power? So Chris sent in, do something so sinister that the block M becomes ubiquitous with that misdeed. No one could wear the block M because it invokes memories of what I have done. So that's foundational. And again, like what, what would that be? I thought like nuclear waste was kind of easy. It's like, oh, you hit this nuclear waste. Um, Chris says, I'd pay a private investigator to plant undercover cameras and microphones inside the Ohio State facilities. Then I'd willingly come forward to the NCAA after months had passed with evidence of my egregious infractions in order to secure the death penalty for the program. I'd provide proof of pavement to my private investigator, video and audio recordings of Ohio State, team meetings, et cetera, to show the breadth of my infractions. So here you are. You're the sleeper agent. I am telling on myself that I've done this huge rule violation. So the idea of like, could you get Michigan the death penalty? Like SMU got, whatever it was. That'd be a big thing. So if you could somehow do something like that, that would be, that would cause irrevocable harm to a major program to set them back um, that far. Jeffy, Jeffy said, plan a virus in their computer system that fires off not interested emails to recruits, no thanks emails to rich alumni, and then emails playbook options to opponents. So that's pretty good, right? We're putting a virus in there. Um, Steve says, I would publicly release the Connor Stallions manifesto. Uh, Rich says, I'd hire Brian Ferentz as the offensive coordinator and Alex Grinch as the defensive coordinator. Jackson says, make them run an air raid offense. Um, yeah, and then Zach says, I would hire a guy to secretly film everyone's in-game signs and then have him stand right by me and tell me what plays they're running and then him put him on a Central Michigan sideline watching our rival on national TV to get caught and then, oh, wait, wait for the NCAA to do nothing for four years, right? So, like, that, maybe it happened. Maybe Jim Harbaugh or Chris Partridge. Chris Partridge was, like, the assistant who – wound up getting fired of that because I guess he didn't tell the truth about stuff. Maybe he was a Buckeye plant and he did it to Michigan. So anyway, I think um, it's, it's fun to think about how you would ruin your rival. But I also think like, think to yourself, what's the most important thing to Ohio state. So I do think a way that would get people to stop giving money in the NIL era is an interesting part of this too. If, if you could do something that, the people that fund the program would, would no longer want to be associated with you, right? I, I think there's room for that. But also, it would have to be really bad because there are some people who would never turn their back on their program no matter what. So I thought it was an interesting thought exercise of what really matters the most. And when you think about programs that have been ruined, you know, a lot of it is people think, Every every program is a bad hire away from falling off a cliff. And again, I, I reference it all the time because it's one of my favorite things that I've done in my career covering Ohio State is when we did it at 2016 at Cleveland.com, like oh, indestructible Ohio State. And that they have not had like the hire that absolutely just ruined them. They haven't had the Rich Rod hire, right? They haven't had the Mike Shula hire at Alabama. They haven't had the hire that Jet that the, the Clay Helton hire at USC that just completely, the the Charlie Strong, Tom Herman hires at Texas. They just completely undermine you. So I do think you could, you could say maybe do something that while you're in there as a sleeper agent, suggest someone as the next head coach, like get that guy hired as the next head coach who you know is going to be horrible because that has a, a real impact. But I, I, nuclear waste in the stadium, I think is still pretty good. Do you think, do you, some people disagree with that. Some people disagreed. I think Jack said, um, he sent a message and said like he disagreed with the idea that a stadium is that important or that even that Michigan Stadium is that good. I think Michigan Stadium is good. Like you, you as an Ohio State fan don't have to think that. But I actually like walking down into it. It's kind of, 
It's nicely located like near campus, but on the edge of campus, right next to all the other sports facilities. And they have parking there. Like I actually, you know, just like Ohio stadium. It's like a, it's like a great historic building in a good spot. And if you couldn't do it there and it's a different, like, like the Browns might tear down their stadium and move out away from downtown a little bit. Like NFL teams do that all the time. But when you're talking about campus and campus area, there's a lot of times fewer options for like where you can go. So if you would render the stadium in, uninhabitable, that would be a real problem. So anyway, you know, just sit around with your friends and say like, yeah, hey, how could I'm a spy? I'm inside the Michigan program. What can I do to ruin them? Anyway, I thought that was a fun way. Hey, what's a, what's a better way to start your day than thinking about how to ruin your rival? All right, let's move on to the second part of what I want to do here, which is most important Buckeyes for various Ohio State coaches. And again, this started with just uh, incredible texter questions, and we cannot be uh, more grateful for our texters. If you want to be part of it, um, you can join 614-662-4509 is the way that you can sign up. You send a, um, a text to that number. You get a link back to sign up. You get a two-week free trial. There's like recruiting camps and stuff starting up in June, and Berm's going to be there, and Landis will be out there sometimes. Also will be out there sometimes providing great coverage of that stuff. That's stuff that's not as, you know, it's not like a news conference. So you might be interested in that. That might not be a terrible thing to get the text for. And again, as always, if you want to bail for a while, you can always bail. You just type stop and you get out. And then if you want to pay six bucks a month for the information, the expertise, the surveys, the fun, the chance to interact with us, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you like it. 662-4509, of course, the 614 area code. All right, most important players for each Ohio State coach. When I thought about the most important player, to me, it's like you're taking that player out and putting in a replacement level player. It's not like you're not going to have a guy there. And it's not like, it's like, well, I didn't get this guy, but maybe I'll get this other guy. So it's not like a recruiting hole. It's not like you have to play a walk-on in this spot, but it's a guy who's such a difference maker and you maybe you just get somebody who's okay or just good there. But I really thought about the ultimate achievement for every head coach. And so for the Jim Trestle player, that was the most important player to Jim Trestle. To me, I had to go with someone who helped Ohio State win a national title in 2002. Because for all of Jim Trestle's success over 10 years, 9-1 and one against Michigan, two other national title games, it would be a wholly different tenure and legacy and reputation if he was not the guy who ended the three-decade drought. If you did not have the miracle 02 season that right now, right, it's the greatest season in Ohio State history, all that underdog stuff that bubbled up to beat Miami that way. Um, so then who is most important for that? I said Chris Gamble. The texters were split on the most important player exactly even. 30% said Maurice Claret and 30% said Troy Smith. Chris Gamble got 9% by the texters. The other options that I gave the texters, Mike Doss got 8%, which I think you can make a case there. Him staying for that 0-2 year, the leadership, the steadiness he provided, sort of like the maybe the, the decision that helped sort of launch that run that Mike Doss is back, right? Is that right? Mike Doss, 8%. Ted Ginn Jr., just I've never seen anybody like him at Ohio State, 7%. Mike Nugent, nails as a kicker, like super important, 4%. Michael Jenkins, caught holy Buckeye, 3%. James Laurinaitis, three-time All-American, 2%. Malcolm Jenkins, 2%. Terrell Pryor, 2%. Uh, Craig Krenzel, 1%. So again, Maurice Claret, Troy Smith, 30% at the top. And again, like important, if you want to take important, like I meant important good, if you want to take like the greatest effect, like you can go Terrell Pryor because Terrell Pryor indirectly or directly helped lead to the end of Jim Trestle at Ohio State. I went Chris Gamble because Chris Gamble playing both ways. He was the second leading receiver on that 02 team and he had some defensive plays, I think four picks in 02, some big interceptions at the end of games. Who else could have done that? And that team needed him to be a two-way player and was that special, and his defense really mattered. And so I thought it, it would have been almost impossible to find someone else to fill, a single player to fill both of Chris Gamble's roles. 
And if he did not fill both those roles, would Ohio State have won the national championship? Now, Maurice Claret, as a true freshman, 1,200 plus rushing yards, the strip on Sean Taylor in the national title game. It's a very compelling case. He would have been my second pick. I, you might be able to coin flip Claret and Gamble. Who's the most important that, to that 02 thing? But I, I had to think, I, I think if you're not going to think about 02, you're, are you willing to give up 02 to keep some to keep Troy Smith? Would you give up 02? Oh, they like they lose a game along the way. Because if they would have lost one of those games along the way, they wouldn't have been in the national title game. You lose a game along the way because of Gamble or Claret's not there, and you don't win the national title, but then you keep all the Troy Smith. You keep Michigan killer Troy Smith. First guy since Tippy died three generations ago to beat Michigan three times as a quarterback. What he does in 04 as a Michigan killer. What he does with the Anthony Gonzalez helicopter pass in 05. What he does in 06, beating Michigan with that Heisman season. Compelling, man. And that whole underdog story, the Glenville pipeline that leads to so much else at Ohio State. I don't want to take Troy Smith out of Ohio State history. But I just think even the totality of what Troy Smith did Three Michigan wins, an undefeated regular season, a Heisman Trophy. I still focused on the national title. So you guys were pretty split on that. Again, to be split on Claret and Smith, I think it's telling you that you're split on the idea of it. I went gamble always. I wasn't here then. I wasn't covering Ohio State then. If I misspoke about anything, I certainly apologize. I feel like I have a handle on doing this for 20 years. I should have... A handle on O2, but I live Troy Smith. I didn't live Maurice Claret and Chris Gamble. And of course, so, 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 so many of you did. So anyway, we split on this. Next up, Luke Fickle. And I appreciated the fact that the texter who asked this, like wanted to throw Luke Fickle in there. And the texters and I both agreed as Braxton Miller. Because like Braxton is the light in that season, that chaotic, disappointing Nerve-wracking, gut-wrenching season. Braxton Miller, 87% of the vote by the Texers. Nobody, I didn't put Joe Bozerman as an option. The other three uh, players I gave the Texers, John Simon, a defensive leader that year, he got 9%. Jonathan Hankins, who's just like a really good defensive player and had been, you know, as impactful as sort of an interior Ohio State defensive lineman as anybody in a very, very long time. He got 2%. And Christian Bryant, who was just a, a baller that year, like was really awesome. And then like you saw right the next year um, when Urban Meyer gets in here and then in 13, when they get to the, when Christian Bryant gets hurt in 13, you see how valuable it is. He was really valuable in 11 though too. But I think it's clearly Braxton Miller. I don't think this is a very long conversation. Braxton gave you hope. And Braxton has, has um, revealed that he's going to be part of the Ohio State Hall of Fame induction this year. I, I think. I think in my time here, and I think I've said this before, I think Ted Ginn Jr. and Braxton Miller stand alone in terms of wow plays, in terms of I've never seen that before, in terms of guys that you just can't wait to see what they do next, in terms of guys that just make you feel good, that have make you want to tell stories to your friends that make you not want to miss a game because you don't want to miss what that might got that guy might do to have that at quarterback as everything else was falling apart, that Braxton stayed and that Braxton showed you like, okay, you didn't know urban Meyer was coming. You didn't know what the future held, but he was the light and he wasn't at the end of the tunnel. He like came out of the tunnel holding the candle and said like, follow me. Follow me into the future. And so to think about that in 11, um, in the most difficult season that Ohio State fans have experienced in, you know, since since Cooper, right? Um, what a gift. What, what a gift he was to the fan base. And so I know a lot of people will be excited about the Hall of Fame weekend. Um, I'm sure the reception that he's going to get at Ohio Stadium as a Hall of Fame inductee will be Amazing. And I, I think he just occupies such a rare and interesting and important place in Ohio State history. And again, I 
I've said it before. I just, I, I sometimes when I watch Lamar Jackson in the NFL and I think about, you know, what Lamar Jackson has done is amazing. And and I don't know if Braxton would have gotten there. And, and I think that like questions about like Braxton as an NFL thrower and all those things. But that skill set of a guy who can do things that nobody else can do, you throw it well enough, you get him in a system that takes advantage of his strengths, man. Um, I think once Braxton moved to receiver, the athleticism isn't as rare. And he just had not played the position his whole life, as, as every other receiver in the NFL has done. They've been making catches and finding ways to get open and playing in traffic since they were 10 years old. And that wasn't Braxton's reality. So, but I always think it's tough when you when you have a guy who is athletic enough to play another position, but then the athleticism at that position does not stand out in the same way. And so in a healthy world, he might have made the switch anyway, but in a healthy world, I would have been fascinated to see Braxton Miller take a shot at quarterback in the NFL. But I think clearly he's he's the guy here for Luke Fickle. All right, Urban Meyer. The most important player for Urban Meyer, again, I think has to relate to the 2014 National Championship team, which means the guy who finished second on this list like, is certainly part of that, but it's why I didn't pick him. So JT Barrett got 29% of the vote from the tech subscribers is the most important Urban Meyer Buckeye. I love, and I've written, and we've talked about a lot, like when you have a quarterback who's the first quarterback that a new head coach goes and recruits himself. And the first guy that he targets and lands, and it's like, okay, this is my plan for the future. And JT Barrett was that for Urban Meyer at Ohio State, just like Tim Tebow was at Florida. We've made that comparison a million times. If you're talking that way, if you're talking – JT stepping in and keeping the 2014 season alive after Braxton got hurt in the preseason. Well, you maybe thought that season was headed off a cliff. And then what he did in 15 and 16 and 17 and a four-year period where he matters that much. And even though he's not there, for, I'm talking myself into this, even though he's not there for the playoff run, he keeps you alive. He gives you the chance to make the playoff run because if he had not been ready as a redshirt freshman, who's coming off his own ACL injury from high school and didn't do much in 13, if he had not been ready for that, Oh man, how many redshirt freshmen are ready? JT's ready, man. It's a case. It's a case. JT perpetually underrated, perpetually difficult to talk about you wind up discussing more of what he's not and not enough of what he is and what he was undoubtedly was a winning quarterback. And 2014 as a young, confident leader and winning quarterback who learned on the fly and kept you in it, you can make that case. But he's not there for the playoff run. And what happens in the playoff run? Zeke is Zeke. So we all agree on Zeke here. I picked Ezekiel Elliott and the Texters picked Ezekiel Elliott. 40% of the vote for Ezekiel Elliott as the most important player in Urban Meyer's tenure. 29% JT Barrett. Cardale Jones third at 9%, which we know what that case is. If you have any other third string quarterback who's not ready for that, that can go down the tubes. But I guess if you're asking yourself, who would you not want to lose in the playoff run. Would you be willing to take out Cardale and maybe you're in like a Jill and Marshall being the quarterback kind of world where you're handing it to Zeke all the time? Or would you want to take Zeke out of there and be like, we've got another running back here. I still think you wouldn't want to lose Zeke, right? Whatever it was, 700 plus rushing yards in those three postseason games. But we know the Cardale case. The Von Bell case is interesting. 7% for Von Bell because Urban's made this case. The Von Bell recruitment, Getting him out of Chattanooga, Tennessee is the moment that Urban Meyer said, okay, we can do this at Ohio State. We can recruit the way that Urban Meyer recruited at Florida. We can do it at Ohio State. Von Bell coming up here from the South is proof. That's the case for Von Bell. Joey Bosa, 6%. That's your top five. Like, hey, by the way, that guy plays a ton as a freshman in 13. He's an All-American in 14. For that great defense, you aren't the same team if you don't have Joey Bosa. Braxton Miller, 3%. Curtis Samuel, Samuel, 2%. Raekwon McMillan and Nick Bosa each got 1%. So I think it's a compelling top five. Zeke, JT, Cardale, Vaughn, Bell, Joey Bosa is your top five. I think Zeke is the right answer, though. Because what, and, 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 and so vivid to me, that year in 2014, the middle of the season, the Big Ten had so many running backs. 
like David Cobb at Minnesota and the guy at Michigan State. I can't remember his name. Um, Melvin Gordon at Wisconsin. It was like this great run of Big Ten running backs where maybe there were like five or six guys who were like, Thousand yard rushers in the Big Ten. And I remember Urban Meyer. This is before Zeke went nuts. Urban Meyer getting asked about that in the middle of the year and him saying, Well, I like our guy too. And it was sort of like, Well, you know, Ezekiel Elliott, he's no David Cobb. And then it was like, You get to the end of the year, it's like, What were we doing? But it took a little bit, right? Whether it's opportunity or just a guy growing into the role or whatever it was, it took a little bit. But by the end, I mean, Melvin Gordon's a high visible finalist. Melvin Gordon could not have done that. I mean, we know the offensive line is good. We know Taylor Decker, Decker and, and Pat Elfline and Billy Price and all those guys. We know that. Jacoby Boren, um, Daryl Baldwin. We know that. That's a really good offensive line by the end of the year. But not, not every back would have done that. So I think Zeke is special enough and enough of a difference maker on a national championship team in the, in the postseason that I would go Zeke over JT, the length of JT, and I would go Zeke over the three-game run of Cardale. Now, if you meld together, right, if you take Cardale's three-game run and JT's four years, if JT had stayed healthy and just done what Cardale did, maybe chuck on some deep balls. And it's one of those things, again, people forget that JT did chuck some deep balls to Devin Smith. Devin Smith wasn't like Cardale Jones was the first guy to be like, hey, this guy's pretty good down the field. Maybe I should throw it to him. JT did that too. So if JT had just stayed there, I think you maybe, maybe it would be JT. But in this world, I think it's Zeke, and we agreed on that. All right, last one is Urban. It's not Urban Day. It's Ryan Day. Who's the most important player for Ryan Day? Justin Fields got 56% of the vote here from the Texters. CJ Stroud got 37%, and nobody else got more than 2%. Marvin Harrison Jr., Garrett Wilson, J.K. Dobbins, right? It's just, it's obviously Fields or Stroud. I said Fields, Justin Fields. And I think it's because you believe Justin Fields leads to CJ Stroud. Justin Fields helps establish. Now, Justin Fields helps establish Ryan Day as a quarterback whisperer and offensive guru at Ohio State. You can make a case for Dwayne Haskins in here, that Dwayne Haskins helps lead to Justin Fields, who helps lead to C.J. Stroud. But when you think of the way Justin played in 19 and 20, two playoff teams, Bales Ohio State out from this Tate Martell, Matthew Baldwin plan that is a little bit amazing to look back on and think like this was what Ohio State had lined up in a world where Dwayne went pro after three years, maybe surprised people a little bit, you know, given what you thought the, the path would have been. If Justin Fields doesn't come, I just, what is 2019? I don't even, I don't even know. Does Tate Martell stay? Do they get a different transfer who is not close to what Justin Fields is? This is another rare guy in terms of, of the complete package of what he was athletically as a thrower, athletically as a runner, as a physical presence, as a tough guy, as a leader, all the attributes you want in a quarterback. And they just kind of fell on their lap. And, and again, he didn't fall on their lap. Ryan Day went and got him. Ryan Day saw that opening. There's this guy at Georgia. They used him in as a wrinkle QB as a freshman. He's, he's not probably going to play there. And there's a window to get this transfer so he can play right away. And Ryan Day's credit of he had enough of a reputation and he was aggressive enough in that moment to go make it happen. CJ, this is one of those where I think maybe the moment of today affects the backwards thinking because CJ is now so much more successful in the NFL than Justin Fields. I don't know if that factors into this voting. Justin saved him. So I think you could argue that 56% to 37%, it should be more overwhelming for Justin Fields. CJ Stroud certainly saved them in his own way. That you think you have Jack Miller lined up. You think you have Kyle McCord coming the next year, but then you add CJ Stroud as the second quarterback in that class with Jack Miller. And if you didn't, and you had had a Jack Miller, Kyle McCord quarterback battle to be the starting quarterback, in 2021 and 2022, like, again, knowing how it worked out in 23 with Kyle McCord, like, what would that have been like? And that CJ's at the Elite 11 with these Ohio State receivers and gets this late offer, and, like, he could have been like, ah, it's too late. You guys are too late on me. I'm not doing it. That's possible. That would have been possible. He absolutely could have said, it's from California. Late in the process in California. And he's like, yeah, I'll come do it. 
both really strong contenders. But Ohio State was more established by the time CJ made his decision. There was a lot that, that Justin Fields, there maybe weren't guarantees. So I think Justin Fields is the right pick here. CJ's a strong case, but I think it's Justin Fields. So again, most important Buckeyes. You guys said Troy Smith and Maurice Claret tied. I went Chris Gamble for Trestle. We agree on Braxton Miller for Fickle. We agree on Ezekiel Elliott for Urban Meyer. And we agree on Justin Fields for Ryan Day. I think this is like a fascinating conversation. I would do this with every head coach in the last 40 years. Who's Nick, who's Nick Saban's most important player? That's a fascinating discussion. I don't know enough about it off the top of my head to have it. Who's Kirby Smart's most important player? Is it Nolan? No, is it Nicobe Dean at linebacker? Like the heartbeat of that first defense? I don't know. Like I don't, they were defensive tackle driven, but they kind of had multiple defensive tackles. Like I don't, is it Stetson Bennett? The way they thought they had a, a USC transfer? at quarterback and they wind up going back to the walk-on like is it Stetson Bennett who's Kirby Smart's most important player um so I think about it because I, th I think when it's like when you think about that coach's legacy who's the turning point who's the focus of the turning point so that's something maybe we can do that on KOTN and do that with some other other coaches but again for now those are our Ohio State answers we'll take a quick break when we come back we're going to get into some rants first about Natty or Bust and then about some other general things and we'll do that all that after this on Kings of Columbus. Doug Maurice back on Kings of Columbus. Certainly would direct you to Kings of the North. Uh, Bill and I will have our playoff picks up there on Kings of the North this week. And guess what? We have Ohio State in the playoff. So we have our full 12 team bracket. We don't say who we think is going to win the national championship because it's more about getting there right now. So um, do we have Michigan in? Do we have Alabama in? Do we have Georgia in? Do we have Texas in? Do we have Penn State in? Uh, get ready for that discussion on Kings of the North. If you're subscribed here to, to the podcast feed to get Kings of Columbus and all the other great content here, uh, we just think you might like trying Kings of the North. So find that feed on YouTube. Find that feed wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'll have our playoff picks coming there. Because again, like, you know, Guess what? Kings of the North, 26 teams right now that we consider our Northern teams. We talk about Ohio State a lot because they're kind of good. All right, let's talk about Natty or Bust, which we did on Kings of the North. I did it on May 16th. If you have not watched or listened to that show, I would direct you toward it. I just accidentally turned it on here on my phone as I as I was doing it right now. Um, I had my old friend Shahan J. Haraja, who I used to do that uh, college football survivor show with him. I wanted an outside voice on Natty or Bust. So I brought him in to do that. So we discussed that. I went through the teams I thought had been out of your bust. And I also kind of said, I don't like this. And so there were people who watched that show and listened to that show and responded. And I wanted to bring a little bit of, of that text or response here uh, to Kings of Columbus. For instance, from John. Nadir Bust is correct, but I also dislike the Nadir Bust mentality. It leads to a slog of a season that isn't very fun. The 2015 team doesn't fit your criteria, but they had so much talent, it felt like they had to repeat. That expectation made the season stressful rather than fun. I'm never doing that again. This team has beat Michigan or bust. Everything beyond that is fun. I think this is a really smart text from John. Again, in my criteria for Natty or bust, one of the things I said was you did not win a national championship with this group of players. So anybody trying to repeat to me couldn't be Natty or bust. Because it's like, well, you just got one. We're not going to put that on a repeat team. And so it was like, if it, you had to have not won one with this player, with, with this group of players, your standard had to be this high. You had to be, so like, again, like Virginia Tech can't be natty or bust because their program is not good enough. But Ohio State can be. Um, you have to be losing players after this season that like feels like, okay, it's like now or never. Clearly Ohio State's there. So like Ohio State fit all my criteria. But I think the slog part absolutely applies to 2015. That was unbelievable. I can remember, and I was part of it. And I maybe learned some lessons from that. But that whole year with the, with the quarterback uncertainty and then early season games, Virginia Tech, Northern Illinois, Hawaii, like not looking great, quarterback uncertainty. We spent so much time going in after games and asking the defending national champions why they weren't playing better, while they were undefeated. And it absolutely, I think the players could feel it. 
the fan base. Now, most of the time, we're trying to reflect the fan base. But I think we all felt the slog. And I don't think you have to be Pollyanna and go in there and be like, oh, that was a great eight-point win over Hawaii. Congrats, guys. I don't think that's the answer. But the expect, ugh, wait, the weight burden weighing down on those guys was real. But I really, I think it was, they're so talented, we know they can do it because they just did it. And practically everybody that matters is back. I think that's different because like right now, you like you think Ohio State can do it because they have good players. You don't know they can do it because they haven't done it. Frankly, they haven't won the games they needed to win with this group of players. They haven't beat Michigan for three years. They didn't beat Georgia in that semifinal. Like that little lousy bowl game, which for a lot of different reasons, but that that's still a fact. So against Missouri. So I, I do think it's different, but the slog is right. That's exactly the right word by John. And what like why? That's why I don't like it. Are we going to turn Ohio State fits every criteria and they by far are the number one Natty or bus team of this year? I think that was my other criteria, only one team at a time. Because I don't want, I don't think the sport should set up like, well, everybody's going to bust at the same time. Like, people can disagree with that. But I think like Natty or bus is like, it's yours for the taking. So they check the boxes, but I don't like it. I don't want our discussion in the preseason and during the season to beat this. Because it's not fun. Brutes Buckeye. I agree with you with how much pressure Natty or Bust adds to the team for a Natty or Bust attitude. But it surely seems like it applies this year. It applied in 1998 for sure, but the 06 team seems like it was pressure from the outside, not the team. So this is one of those where, again, like, what are other, what are other Natty or Bust years? Um... I do think now your bus, bus pressure can come from outside or inside. And, you know, when Denzel Burke kind of says now to your bus, like if they want to do that, that's their decision. Ryan Day's not going to do it. Ryan Day's going to say one week at a time, all that kind of stuff. If the players want to do it because they feel like that's a way to motivate themselves, that's their business. I'm not going to tell Denzel Burke to not be now to your bus. I just might tell you to not be now to your bus because it's not fun. Uh, this is an interesting point from Ron in uh, Jupiter, Florida. Longtime friend of the show. I thought 2022 was kind of natty or bust with CJ Stroud returning, et cetera. I did not have this on my list when I did it on the KOTN. It's interesting. And Ohio State was number two in the preseason that year behind Alabama. They got um, six of 63 first place votes. It was Bama one. Ohio State two, Georgia three, but like uh, Bama got 54 first place votes and Ohio State got six. So that's a, doesn't mean you can't be now to your bust. I guess I hadn't necessarily thought of it as much that way. Um, Possibly. So then it's like, well, okay, then like some of these guys maybe have been through this, but I, CJ being back was a huge deal, but he also couldn't leave. I think the choice that so many of these players made adds to the Natty or bust a little bit. If it's just like, well, CJ's back, like this is CJ's last year, but like he had to be here. Like JT Tui Moloa didn't have to be here. Donovan Jackson didn't have to be here. Denzel Burke didn't have to be here. Jordan Hancock didn't have to be here. Trayvon Henderson didn't have to be here. Emeka Buka didn't have to be here. They chose to be here. So that adds to it a little bit. But it's it's also one of those, like once you start doing this, it's like, well, was Ohio State in 2022? 2022 now to your bust were they now to your bust in 2015 were they now to your bust in 20 2006 were they now to your bust in 1998 you can start talking to yourself and like well Ohio State's now to your bust every year like Ohio State's now to your bust every year their quarterback is returning or something which is not the case this year but Will Howard does have experience so that we've established there's no rebuilding no reloading at ohio state just when you think it's the year the year before it happens the year before there's no the year but I, it doesn't mean it's natty or bust every year so if you want to argue for 2022 i think it's an interesting argument which is why i brought it up i think rod made an inter interesting point there this is a ezra and then we have another texas along the same lines adding to this point again i kind of had my four your program has to have the standard. You haven't won a national title with this group. Um, guys are leaving after this year, and you're the one team for this year that it applies to. Those are my four. Ezra says, I think it's now to your bust this year. I like your criteria, but I'd add where Ryan Day is as a fifth reason. 
Lost to his rival three straight years, doesn't have a title in his tenure, and now he has Saban and Harbaugh gone. Nearly the entire excellent 2021 recruiting class back and added some very high-impact transfers. To me, it's almost a question of, if not now, then when? I'd still revel in a Big Ten title, especially a win over Michigan, but if they fall short of the championship, then it's a disappointment and a ding on day, in my opinion. So this is similar. This is from Joe. This is absolutely a Natty bust season. I think another of the criteria is the coach having a prove it season. Coop needed it. Tress needed to do it. Needed to do it again to prove 2002 wasn't a fluke. Tress recovered from not getting it done. I guess in 06 and 07, but Cooper never did. Again, 98 probably the best example, but 96 close to it. Right? Dave needs this to prove to everyone that he is the coach that we hope he is. So I do think that's interesting from the standpoint of. If it applies individually to a coach, would your fifth criteria be your coach doesn't have a title? So could Kirby Smart ever lead a Georgia team again that you would call natty or bust? If they don't win a title in the next eight years and this era of Georgia guys doesn't have a title, I think you could say the team is natty or bust, but Kirby Smart maybe wouldn't be. I didn't have a Bama team on my natty or bust list on KOTN because it's like, well, once Bama wins, it's like they're not natty or bust because they're always there. You always assume they're going to win another one. And if they don't win one now, they'll win it next year. How can you be bust? It's like Alabama got to the point where they were natty or next year. So that's not bust. So I do think it it is interesting to add that component. I don't think it is a requirement, but it is uh it is it's exponential when you add coach who's been good but never gotten over the top to this discussion. But again, I don't like it. This is the last one we're going to do here. I do not like this discussion. Eric says the 98 and 06 teams were both teams with extremely higher expectations, but the 98 team is the better comparison for this one. The 98 team checks all the boxes. No titles before. National championship standard built up. We knew 1999 would be a rebuilding, reloading, reset year. There was no other team that really stood out above Ohio State, and the pressure is on the coach to prove himself. So, Thinking that that 98 is just a better comparison for it than 06. Partly of uh, Eric also said like 06 lost so much on defense. We know they lost AJ Hawk and Bobby Carpenter and Anthony Schlegel and Dante Whitner and all those guys off the defense from the year before. But as it turned out, James Laurinaitis and Malcolm Jenkins and a lot of those guys were ready to step in right away. So I agree 98 is better. I think you can still argue 06 because of what was back on offense. They were a basic, almost a unanimous number one in the preseason. They were they were number one the entire regular season. And now this is, again, why I don't like this conversation because the greatest comparison for 2024 Ohio State is 1998 Ohio State that lost to Michigan State and Nick Saban and like never, like never recovered from it. So Maybe that makes you say, I don't, why is this guy talking about anything that's going to compare? Hey, you know what you want to do? You guys want to talk about 1998 Ohio State again? For like 15 minutes, just dig deep. Here's the difference. And maybe this makes you feel good. 1999 Ohio, 1998 Ohio State would have made the playoff. And then you take your shot with that team, with that talent. So. The best thing about this conversation for Ohio State fans is that in the 12-team playoff world, natty or bust does not mean a single regular season lost can bust you, which has always been the case that it could before. Did it in, did it in 15? 2015 team absolutely makes the playoffs. It's like, all right, they lost to Michigan State. Who cares? You take their chances. You'd think they would. The odds would have had them as high as anybody in 15. They would have been at least a co fifth. It's a 12 team playoff, and the odds come out in 15, and Ohio State's the seven seed. They're still like the co favorite to win it. And you think about all these Ohio State teams and all the Cooper teams that would have gotten in. So, like Tressel, right? Tress got in in 06 and 07 and couldn't quite get over the top. But the teams that couldn't get in, like that's not going to happen. So, if the 98 discussion scares you, take solace in that, that it can't. 2024 can't bust the same way 1998 did because that bust won't bust this team. All right. Last quick break. When we come back, we'll do some other rants from our tech subscribers here on Kings of Columbus. Doug Maurice back on Kings of Columbus, 614-662-4509 if you want to be a texter and get to send in rants. 
So again, this is this is a, a style of show that I started back on Buckeye Talk. Before I came here, I was doing it once a week, just me ranting. I haven't done it as much lately. May get back to it, but I think you're pretty happy right now. So maybe if this season goes as many of us think it could, as many of you think it could, there won't be any rants. It'll just be happy, happy time. Happy time, USA. So we do, it's, we've started a tradition now. We do anti-rants on Valentine's Day where you give you a chance to talk about all the things you love about Ohio. Maybe we'll do it in November. Be like anti-rants in November. I love this team and I love this season and I love this program. I'm so happy. Maybe we'll do it the week after the mission game. I love that. I love everything. I'm so happy. Could be. So, um, you know, there's been, like, there's a lot changing. We have not talked about it a ton here on Kings of Columbus. We have not talked about it a ton on Kings of the North. With all this stuff that's happening with moving towards direct payment of players and the decisions that are being made, the settlement that all the conferences approved to give back pay back to 2016 for players who were ruled as amateurs then and couldn't get money and they're going to they're gonna pay them. They, they figure out how they're going to pay that. There's a lot of anxiety about who should pay. Should Are the smaller conferences bearing too much of the burden um, of that? And then the specifics going forward, will there still be outside collective somehow? Will it all be direct payment inside athletic departments? I thought that collectives would go away and all this would be inside. It feels like with the plan now, they're going to share 22% of the revenue, which again, directly sharing the revenue is a big deal. But you still that can then have outside companies and I guess outside donors who just want to give money to players. That's separate than the revenue sharing. So would you keep that in a collective world that's outside, that the athletic department works with the collective? That's stupid to me. That's my rant. Why? Why do you need outside? Bring the endorsements, bring donor donations, if, if a booster wants to give a million dollars to the football program or the athletic department to spread it among other school uh, other teams, give it to the athletic department and say, pay the players with this. Give this. This is more money for the players. And if the limited or Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever wants to have a, 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 an agreement with Emeka Buka to be a, a guy for them, I don't think the athletic department should like get a cut, but let the athletic department facilitate it. Or, or, or be like the some kind of middleman, um, or or just let the player do that on his own. The player and his agent can get the wings endorsement. Just do that. But why are you going through a collective? So the idea that collectives might still have a role is bonkers to me. Why get rid of them? They don't. They they were only born into existence in this tiny little window to fill a gap. And if we're going to fill it with common sense, we don't need to fill it with collectives that you still may or may not trust. It's it's it crazy to me. The people who are running collectives are people who should be giving money to athletic departments that are then held responsible. They should not be the, the people taking in the money and then they're responsible. It, 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 I don't trust them. I'm not saying specifically I don't, but it's like I just don't trust that system. The system is stupid. So please let's not have it be that. We're working it out, but we don't talk about it a ton here because – we talk about ball <laughs> and like, I just, I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy that five minutes. And there's so much that's up in the air when it's finalized, finalized, finalized. And we know exactly what's going to happen. We'll tell you. So we know that players are going to get back pay. Great. Former players are going to pay. Great. They're going to share 22% of revenue. Great. Should they probably share more? Yes. Are they collectively bargaining with players right now? No. Will they eventually, the NCAA is trying to fight it, but they'll probably have to get to that because they can't, the pro leagues share 50% of revenue, 22% is not going to cut it for very long. But also, please understand, this is super complicated. It's much more complicated than the pros. Maybe cut everybody a little bit of a break if this gigantic step forward is not perfect in the moment. So that was too much of that. Your rants are not about this. There's not a lot. Of, I, I was open to this. It's like, what do you want to rant about? You, your team's in pretty good shape. Your sport's kind of jacked. That's not where a lot of people went. It's not, which is which is also fine because maybe that's not on your mind because it's the summer. Hey, what'd you do this summer? Oh, man. I just really thought about the best way to implement a pay per 
for play system and to end amateurism in college sports. I just, I just went to the lake. I was out of my ski do and I was just like, you know what? I think it should be 29% of revenue. And then I just like got off my ski do and I went inside and I, and I sat down with a, with a pencil and a, and a, and a notebook and I worked it out. <laughs> I was, I was on, you guys got on the new Tron ride at uh, Disney world's in the magic kingdom. It's a Tron ride. Anyway, I was on Tron and I thought to myself, I think there's a way for NIL collectives to still exist in this system. <laughs> Let's not think about it. This is Lee. His rant. I heard you and Berm talking about the Big Ten pushing back on perception. I feel like the timing for that is just about right. I think the weakness of the Big Ten West in the past has hurt the perception of the conference as a whole. We all look forward to the SEC championship game down here. Lee is from the South. Because it's almost always a great game. The Big Ten championship was almost always guaranteed to be a dud because of the weakness of the Western Conference teams. Now that there isn't an East-West anymore, I think it will be easier to change the perception if we get a second Ohio State-Oregon game, who wouldn't want to see that? This is a great point. And the Big Ten should be pushing it. That's our point. It's like, it's a new world. It's a new era. Landis and I were talking about this. Like everything the SEC does is a TV show. They think that way. They think like a marketing team. They think like a streaming service. They don't think like a, we are a collection of teams that plays sports and has academic standards. They don't think that way. They think of it as a TV show. That was Landis's phrase. And I just think the Big Ten needs to think of it that way because they should be making this point. Would you run a Big Ten commercial that's like a bunch of friends sitting around at the bar saying like, hey, hey guys, remember how the Big Ten title game used to suck? It's going to be awesome now. I guess you couldn't because the Big Ten's number one thing it wants to do is not hurt anybody's feelings. We were mean to Iowa. Be a funny commercial, though. And true. But there's a version of that. Like, can you run like uh, like some like the new Big Ten? That's not run. We love. Everybody loves. And actually looking forward to the new version of it. We love the uh, coast to coast. Right, campus things popping up with uh, with the song. Everybody loves a Big Ten commercial, right? And I can't like, what's it going to look like when they have UCLA? It's going to be all volleyball. UCLA and USC. It's going to be volleyball and and the Hollywood Walk of Fame or whatever. And then US, uh, Oregon and Washington. What's that going to look like? But they should be pushing that now, like a, running a whole series of commercials about the new Big Ten, the new world of the Big Ten. Like, get on board now. This is the new conference of like where it's at. So let's not wait. Let's just not have the Big Ten sit back and be like, oh, like, like in December, they'll be like, oh, look, our championship game's good. Remind people. It's a TV show. All right, let's go to number two. This is a football question from our guy, Will. I'm frustrated by Ohio State's seeming inability to maximize extremely athletic players who may not exactly fit a mold we already have. I think it started with Baron Browning primarily. I'm worried about it happening to Sonny Styles, CJ Hicks, Arvell Reese, Kenyatta Jackson. And Gabe Powers as well to some extent. Part of me also fears it's going to happen on the other side of the ball with tight end Jelani Thurman. I think it's extremely obvious his upside is far and away the best in the tight end room. I think you've got to play him and let him learn on the field. Akron and Western Michigan aren't beating us regardless of how he plays. I think having a developed Thurman could be a difference maker this postseason. I understand what Will's saying here. And I actually, there's some stuff I was rewatching um, of the 2019 Ohio State Michigan game that reminded me of little uh, a little of this. And... I think there's something to it. And I think you don't like Knowles was brought in here to implement a scheme, but you don't want to get so caught up in a scheme that you don't let dudes be dudes. And I still think the dude factor on defense can rise a little bit. So I continue to be, uh, again, it's not worried. It's not, I'm going to have to do, I, I've never ridden a ski do. I would like to ride a jet ski at some point. I have never ridden one. Help me. What? <laughs> I'm now officially inviting myself on your vacations. Hey, honey. I forgot to tell you about our little lake trip. Uh, Doug's coming. Who's Doug? The guy on my phone. Doug. Podcast guy? And he's never ridden one before? I require two life jackets also, by the way. Um. I don't even know why I started saying about that. You got to let dudes be dudes. You got to let ski dudes be ski dudes. You got to let dudes be dudes. And so I don't think you want to get so scheme heavy that you don't 
find a way to take advantage of guys' skills. Oh, I was going to say, I'm not going to sit on a ski do and worry about CJ Hicks and Sonny Styles sharing one position, but I kind of am. So I would love to see Sonny Styles just unleashed and like positionless Sonny Styles just playing 80% of snaps and doing something. Um, coaches like structure. You guys know, like if you've been listening to me for a while, like the bear, the usage of Baron Browning, like drove me up a wall his whole entire career. I blame most of it on Bill Davis, but I think other people probably were at fault too. And so I agree with it. And I think it can be difficult. Part of it is you have so many good players. Like who do you choose to be the guy that's like, well, we got to let that guy just be a dude. Um, but I also think you can get caught up in what you are and what you have been. I think Will's point of that is like, well, we've never had a guy do that before. It's like, okay, well, you never had a guy do what Ted Ginn Jr. did either, but you just figured it out, right? Didn't you? So I think it's a reasonable worry. I would like to hear Landis on this. So maybe we'll bring that up on a future show when he's here too. All right, this is Vinny with a good one. I like when your rants are about us. I open us up to that. Like, come at us. We are not infallible. Is sign up for the text to yell at us, 614-662-4509. Not, not the other guys, just me. It's okay, just me. I'm old, I can take it. I'm a man, I'm 50. This is Vinny in Florida. Rant, all capital letters. Every discussion about this offensive line is driving me crazy. Y'all spend episode after episode and month after month talking about how offensive line is a developmental position, and then you turn around and act like these guys aren't going to get better year over year. Huh? How good will this offensive line be if they've got four to five guys with a year or more of starting experience and each get 10% better? Why are we so adamant about pushing Josh Fryer off right tackle despite Big Ten accolades he won last year? The whole offensive line discussion just seems so reductive to me. Like, I get it. A golden goose portal tackle could have been could have um, helped, but in any other area of college football, I think we'd feel pretty good about this offensive line heading into the fall, right? If you didn't have a portal where you could have been hoping for a guy. Only replacing the right guard from a line that wasn't perfect, but wasn't Swiss cheese either. This is Vinny in Florida. This is a good rant, Vinny. Um, for me, it's about the Ohio State standard. And so for me, by the way, they did go get a center. They went and got the Bama center who couldn't snap in the last time you saw him play. Like the, 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 the defining story of the Alabama-Michigan semifinal was that the Alabama center had huge snap problems, and he's now Ohio State center. So like that, you know, I, I just to remind everybody of that, um, the way they got their two starting tackles is not the Ohio state standard. And so I maybe can get stuck on that because it's not about who you were, how you got here. It's how you play now. And I understand that. I also like Paris Johnson and Taylor Decker and Nicholas Petit Frere and Thayer Munford and like guys who like, so like neither Josh Fryer nor Josh Simmons was a plan. Right to say that you're going to go get the San Diego State right tackle and make him your left tackle just is not the plan. And to say that Josh Fryer and his recruiting grade and the way all that stuff happened, they've done it before again. Daryl Baldwin, Chase Ferris from 14 and 15 were the right tackle as the fifth guy on that line. But like Fryer, half the time feels like he's supposed to be the best guy on the line, and he's just like an underrated, like long term guy who developed. Well, that shouldn't be your best offensive lineman at Ohio State. And, and Donovan Jackson's a five star, three year starter who should be your best offensive lineman this year. But anyway, maybe I'm stuck on that. And if I'm stuck on, you can get stuck on recruiting. And like five years into a guy's career, be like, I don't know. He was a three star. It's like, what's the point? Who cares? So that's part of it. And, and I'll take that. That's a fair critique of the, of the way I envision this. So perhaps I'm, I'm stuck too much on still like sort of trying to blame Ohio State for like, uh, you better hope this works out because your plan stunk how to bring this line together. Alabama transfer at right guard. Two right tackles who in most Ohio State era, era, this is not how you get tackles. Left guard fits the bill, and then you don't know who the right guard is right now because you just went through spring practice and nobody claimed the job. So yeah, they should be better. But still, when you think about the precision in which almost every other part of the team is planned, this is what we're doing on the defensive line. We got the recruiting back in the secondary. This is what we're doing in, at cornerback. This is what we're doing at receiver. We had Trayvon Henderson at running back, and we added Quinchon Junkins. Right, like the, the two places where right now where there's not a specific plan that was set in motion years ago that they are following, the two places that's the case are quarterback and offensive line, which are the two positions we talk about. So I love process in anything. I would rather watch a movie about a movie being made than watch the movie itself. So I might get two. I love roster building. It's my favorite part of pro sports is roster building. 
I might be too caught up in the roster building of this Ohio State team, and I admit that. But I also will give, and I'll give Vinny the 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 correct um, idea that like they should be better. So it's a good rant, Vinny. Thanks for bringing it at us. Doesn't mean we're going to stop talking about the offensive line, but it's good for me to put away, uh, put it in my brain hole. This is Ben. I don't know if this even qualifies as a rant because it's incredibly tame. It's just a thing I've noticed that's mildly amusing. The group of you to a man uses the phrase, quote, in a world where, fill in the blank, like five times per week. I think I hear something phrased that way elsewhere maybe once a year. For example, in a world where they lose to Oregon but beat Michigan, or in a world where Jermaine Matthews plays less on special teams, and so on. Will we ever live in a world where you guys go an entire week without saying in a world? I do acknowledge that in a world where you're in front of a microphone for several hours every week, you're going to end up leaning on certain useful phrases a lot. Um, gah, now you've got me doing it. So this is great for Ben. So when you listen to somebody a lot, you really get to understand their tics and their things they lean on. And the thing that I think is the best point about this is I hate things that are only said in a sports context and never said in anything else. The one that drives me crazy is how many times in life do you talk about a subject and apply the discussion of that subject by saying like hyphen wise at the end of the discussion? Like if you said to somebody in your family, groceries wise, what do we need from the store? Right? That is not how people talk. People talk that way in sports all the time. Hyphen wise. Movie wise, what do you guys think we should go see tonight? Nobody says that. People say it in sports all the time. I try not to say that because it drives me so crazy. But in a world where so many other people say it, you just get used to it. I did that on purpose. Um, I love it. I am, and I am open for anyone who ever wants to like point out the things that we say and the things that we do that are like, man, you guys love to do blank. Love that conversation. Make fun of us. This is from uh, Matt. Hey, Doug. Rant from Matt in Florida. What is most likely going to be the ultimate outcome to Michigan's cheating scandal? I feel like the national media and football scene have conveniently forgotten all about this. So the thing that happened is that Jim Harbaugh left, which was like, I mean, just like the timing of this of like, if you, if you don't like Jim Harbaugh, it probably drives you crazy because like he, he just, he robbed the bank and he got out of town. Right. And, and like, now it's just like, it doesn't matter. Like you're, it's over. It's over. He came in, this guy, he came into town. He took off his shirt. He lived in a tree. He slept over at a teenager's house. And then four years later, he robbed the bank and left. And you can't catch him. So that's what happened. And that's why it's largely out of mind, I think, of the discussion. And also it is the glacial pace of anything with the NCAA. And it's one of like justice delayed is justice denied, right? There's a point to this that it's like, I mean, I guess, you know, you want you want it to be thorough. And if it winds, winds up that Michigan gets severe sanctions that penalizes the program with scholarships or a postseason ban or anything down the line, that will be felt. But like they're not, they're not bearing any brunt of their actions at the moment. And, and so like, again, I, I want to talk about this consistently, whether it's on a KOTN show that appeals to a Northern audience, which includes Michigan fans, or whether it's a Kings of Columbus show that's just Ohio State fans. I think Michigan was helped by the Connor Stallions cheating. I think it helped them, helped them be a better football team in 2021, 2022, and the early part of 2023. And then I think once they got caught and it stopped, I think and Jim Harbaugh was suspended and all those things. I think they, on the field, earned the national championship last year. So I said at the time that I thought the Big Ten's actions to suspend Jim Harbaugh and not wait until the NCAA acted was the right decision. And I think it worked out for Michigan, actually, because it's like Harbaugh got suspended. They overcame that. And still won the national title. But if, if nothing had been done and we were still waiting for anything to be done, at least something was done. Something. Maybe you view it as not enough, but it wasn't nothing. To have your head coach suspended for three games, including the Ohio State game, it's, it's not nothing. 
That's for sure. So I thought something had to be done because we know of the glacial pace. But the fact that he's gone, but like it's still going to happen. Like there's still going to be an NCAA ruling. I have no idea what it's going to be. I think though, I was about to say it. Wow. I was about to say it. <laughs> in a world, in a world where I think people want to get away from penalizing players. And we have created a situation now. It's like, what, what would players even get penalized for? So all that stuff, when you're penalizing programs because players took money, all that kind of stuff, I think people are over that. And now we now there's a situation where you uh, there's nothing even to get penalized for. But this is so different than that. This is in-game tactical advantage. You potentially could even be putting opponents at risk if you know what's going to happen and guys could get set up to take a big hit or something like that. I think in the last couple of years, we've become accustomed to ignoring the NCAA because nobody believes in the NCAA, especially when it relates to player penalties. This is not that, so I don't think it should be ignored. But I think we've fallen into the trap of ignoring the NCAA, and that's why it's happened. But this is not that. This is old-fashioned cheating. This is not amateurism model cheating. This is... This is practically, I mean, this is like, you know, Michigan had 20 and now you look up and now they have 23 on the scoreboard because somebody snuck a three up there. So I think it should remain part of the discussion. It's like I think Georgia players driving recklessly should remain part of the discussion. It's not over. It's not adjudicated. It's not over. It's not done. It's not, it's not the past yet. So it should remain part of the conversation. And from the Michigan side of things, congratulations on the national title, what they did to beat Ohio State without Harbaugh and then to go on and, and, and win the national championship, they do deserve credit for that. But for people to believe that they also gained an unfair advantage for two and a half seasons through their other actions, I also think it's a fair thing, and we'll see what the NCAA says. But I think – and this is why – I mean, it's the NCAA's fault. You can't be terrible at your job and then have people hanging on your every word. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a functional governing body for a million different reasons, but this is one of them. So that people can have faith in something. It's very aggravating when people don't have faith in rules and laws and structure. Because guess what? Structure's good. Everybody doing whatever they want to do with no regard for anybody else is no way to live. It's no way to run a sport and it's no way to live. And But when your governing body has so many holes in it, you encourage people to think that way. And I don't like it. Joseph in Atlanta, our guy, I hate conference expansion. Now, I understand the economics and importance and so forth, so I think it was the right call. But as a fan, it still sucks. I don't give a darn about any of the West Coast Big Ten teams and or American Rutlers, uh, Maryland and Rutgers, and I don't think I ever will. Sure, it'll be a fun helmet game to see USC and Oregon, to see USC and Oregon will be an awesome, intense game. But I don't think I'll ever have any real feeling or connection to the programs themselves. This is Joseph in Atlanta. So I think the horse is out of the barn here. So the thing is, once you're not your tiny little thing anymore, once you're not – I guess Penn State and Nebraska were still enough like Ohio State and Michigan to feel like those expansions were different. So maybe if you would have stopped at a 12-team Big Ten that had Penn State and Nebraska and you could feel like these are still tangentially Midwestern teams that have something in common with the team I care about. We can have a rivalry with their fan bases. I can probably drive to their games. So if you stayed at that, okay. But once you add Rutgers and Maryland, now just get the best teams you can. So to me, like it's this isn't the line. The line was Rutgers and Maryland. And if you're going to add Rutgers and Maryland, you may as well add Oregon and USC because now you're at an ocean anyway. So now just get the best teams because you're no longer geographic and parochial and tiny. Now you're expansive. So now you just want good football. And it's not about rivalries and it's not about familiarity and it's not about geography. It's about the best Saturdays you can make. So I, I'm not saying the rant is wrong by any stretch, but like, really the, t the time to have this rant was when they added Rutgers in Maryland. Cause now it's like, well, and like our, if the big 10 adds Clemson and Florida state or Miami and Florida, or whatever, are you going to rant about that? It's like, what's the difference between adding Florida state and Clemson and adding USC and UCLA? 
Now you both had the dips, right? You're both dipping down on the coasts. You got a little ocean dangle on both sides. One ocean dangles, may as well have two ocean dangles. What I always say, don't go to the beach with me. So I get it. And if you could snap your fingers and go back to a traditional Midwestern Big Ten where the sport is regional and maybe you still have a national playoff, but you really just kind of play the teams in your area, maybe play one non-conference banger and then send your best from your little area to the playoff and say, we're going to have a Pac-12 team and a Big Ten team and a Big 12 team and an SEC team and an ACC team. And maybe you could get even more geographic, like you, maybe you shrank down. What if we had gone the opposite way? What if there were eight power conferences really shrunk down? Eight, eight team power conferences. And the whole deal is you play each other. Now, we're, now I'm creating something. You play each other. You play the other seven teams, and then you play whatever else you want to do in the non-conference. And then you play a conference title game or not, however you determine a champ, determine your champ, and the playoff is the eight champs. And that's it. And it's geographic. There's something to that, but that's not where we are. So if you're going to have conference expansion, my main thing is you've already started. You may as well keep going. All right. Last one. This is, oh, no, not the last one. There's two more. This is a rant from uh, DLGD. This is off an Apple story that just came out. This is one of those things like people make a list in the summer because they're desperate for content and they're terrible at it. So my general advice on this is people are idiots and they're desperate for clicks and ignore them because there's not, when it's something that no person can actually have expertise in, then their opinion doesn't matter. So this is a list of iconic helmets, but I like the rant. Your helmet is not iconic if you just write the name of the team on the side. That is the opposite of being iconic. Yeah, we realize some are in cursive, and it's not impressive. Looking at you, UCLA, Florida, and Ole Miss. So um, Ohio State was number one on this list. You're lucky Ohio State is number one, or the boss would need to take this entire writing staff to jail after this crime of an article. Do they even watch games? So this, I think Ohio State was one and Michigan was two on this list. But again, it was ridiculous. It's a, it, it's like, who's it? Who is it a cursive script expert? Who's the expert? Oh, iconic helmets. I'm Steve. I'm making a list. Who cares? You're an idiot, Steve. Because it's not even an opinion. It's just, it's just, it's like, it's not even an opinion. It's not like you even thought about it. It's just like, oh, can, I found an old Miss picture, put them 11th. But it is funny to me how many teams just have their name in, in cursive on the side. Which I do think is like it's really quite differentiating when you think about Ohio State and Michigan and that they have this particular helmet design that is very distinctive and iconic. I mean, you have to admit that the, the Michigan helmet's iconic. Distinctive and iconic without just saying like the name of the team on it. Penn State in a similar way is like that. Alabama in a similar way is like that. Like you, you could look at their helmet and know exactly who they are without having to write Penn State on the side. But yes, I agree. If your helmet is just the name of your mascot or the name of your school, it doesn't matter how fancy the cursive is. It's not iconic. Love that rant. Eric with the last one. Kings of Columbus seems to only have an episode once every few weeks. Can we please have more? So we do do it once a week. So you should be able to find it in the podcast feed. Usually every Wednesday. Usually every Wednesday. That's the plan. That's kind of how we've fallen into this. And that is the plan going forward. So as you guys know, we're going to go to five days a week with Kings of the North. We're still working out exactly how post-game stuff is going to go. But we want to keep like the local show once a week. So it is absolutely the plan that Bill and I will continue to do a Kings of Columbus wholly focused on Ohio State once a week during the season. Probably on Wednesdays. And the other thing I would tell you is that we are going to wind up talking a lot of Kings of the North. Excuse me, talking a lot of Ohio State on Kings of the North. The way I've always thought about it is Columbus is the capital of Northern football. Just like if you had a capital of Southern football, it's Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And if you're going to have a show where you talk a lot about Southern football, yes, you're going to talk about Miami and Texas and LSU and Old Miss, but you are going to talk a lot about Alabama and Georgia. And we are going to do the same thing here. 
Perhaps as we have started this, I have had us talk a little less Ohio State than we should because we want to be welcoming to all these outside fan bases and we want to give Iowa State and Oregon and Boston College and Colorado and Minnesota and Wisconsin and Penn State and Michigan State fans a place. We want to acknowledge the the interesting and and you know hopeful things about their teams and we don't want to hit them over the head. We are Ohio State reporters, right? That's how Bill and I made our bones. So we don't want anyone to think like that's all that show is. But once the season starts, guess what we're going to be talking about? The best teams in the North. Guess who's going to be one of the best teams in the North? Probably the best team in the North, Ohio State. So that show, and I talked about this on KOTN recently, I perhaps at times have mislabeled that show as a Northern football show when it really should be and is and will be in the season, a national college football show through a Northern lens. In the off season, we're not going to break down Georgia and Alabama the way we break down Ohio State and Michigan. We're just not. But like we just did the playoff show, like all whatever happens in the South matters to the North, but we're always going to have the Northern idea, the, the Northern framework, the Northern context. And we're not going to be dishonest. But we're going to try to, you know, like remind people that Northern football is good because sometimes it feels like people don't think that. And they should. By the way, what was the national title game last year? So that's what that show is. So if you want more Kings of Columbus type conversation from me and Bill, you will find some versions of that on Kings of the North every day. You will. You just will. But you also will find it on Kings of Columbus once a week. Okay. Thanks to you guys for uh, making this part of your Ohio State fan experience. We're so grateful here at the podcast for everything that you guys make possible for us. Um, you know, we'd be nothing if you guys didn't tune in, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on a uh, podcast feed. And um, we just feel like we have some cool stuff coming. We're still growing. We're still changing. We're still evolving. We're still trying different ways to bring you the best coverage possible certainly of Ohio State football, and then with what we're doing on Kings of the North of Northern football in general. Uh, in, ge- in general, um, want to say congratulations to our producer, Mike Yorstowski, who is recently married. Mike, pop in here. You're, you're a married man now. Are you mature? Are you uh, wise? What does it mean now that you're married? Yeah, I'll tell you what, Doug. It, uh, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you for saying that. But no, it was a great day. Uh, got married on June 1st to my beautiful wife, Allison, and uh, it was everything we could have imagined and more. It was, uh, it was a great day, uh, surrounded by our friends and our family and perfect weather and everything you could imagine. So uh, I'm a nice. married man now. So Look at, lots that. Of Look at that smile. Look at that yeah. smile. So- it's hard not to. You know, I got a beautiful... Uh, wife now and who's the best woman I've ever met in my life. So uh, I'm, I'm, we're really excited. You'll be beaten down by life. Yeah, you're making me start again. crying again. I'm emotional. Yeah. I cried too much on Saturdays. You oh, start crying again. I love it. You got to cry. You cried at your wedding? I cried at my oh, wedding. Oh, yeah. Totally. I cried you like cried? a baby. Yeah, oh. I cried like a baby. Yeah. I love male emotion. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Give me male Yeah, I, t- I took a lot of heat from it from my, from my friends and my family. But I'm like, you know Dude. what? What do you want? I love love. So. No, I am much more a happy crier than a sad crier. Yeah. Like I am like a happy. I'm the player. same way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I see no, people I, happy and uh, filled with emotion that they're really happy yeah. about. Yeah. It brings a yeah. smile to your face. Yeah. No I cried in my vows. Did you cry in your vows? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was, oh. uh, that was tough. We wrote our own vows. So that was, uh, that was tough to get through. It was, uh, oh, man. A lot of pausing, but uh, no, it was good. Love it, it was great. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, congratulations, yeah. of course. Thank you. Uh, Mike Mike makes everything run here for us at Kings of Columbus and Kings of the North. So we'll be back next week. Landis and I will be talking some lessons from 2019 Ohio State, Michigan. Find us on Kings of the North for now. He's Mike Yurstowski. I'm Doug Maurice, And that was Kings of Columbus.